All right, so that brings me to this last point. So this is the third part of our big shift and the core strategy, and that is there is no place like production. So I talked about how sort of we de-emphasized running functional tests in the lab environment. At the same time, we understood that it has a place. It has a place in, um, in, in production in particular, uh, because the production environment is, is very unique. You know, there is, uh, first of all, the, the full breadth and you know sort of diversity of the uh, environment that you have in production you simply cannot replicate inside the lab and you get real workload uh, in production that is also very hard to replicate in the lab we used to do pretty significant effort in doing for example performance testing in the lab and we found that most of the time we were just dealing with uh, results that were very noisy and it didn't really give us a, a, a good indicator of what the actual performance was going to be. We were sort of, we'll take some metrics and measures in the lab and then we'll extrapolate what that would look like in production. So I mean, there was, it was not even a, a, a good system. So we, we rely in production. Now when we talk about production testing, you know, people sort of like, whoa, what do you mean? Like you literally, you run test in production? And the answer is yes, we do run test in production. But testing in production is really two things. The first is a set of practices that we have that safeguards the production. Um, you know, sort of these are the safe deployment practice and the exposure control, the feature flag, and you know some of the stuff that you heard in Buck's talk, and Ed will go into more detail. They, those are just practices that allow us to deploy change in a progressively, uh, you know, in, in progressive manner in in production. We we that's that's part of production production testing. Um, then you have telemetry. Telemetry is. Test results, you know, failures, exception, performance data, security. Buck talked about how we detect certain <clears throat> security issues in production. These things are, in in a, in a sense, you know, test running in in production. So that's that's what I also include as part of the uh, what what happens in production. Simulating failures. So the production environment is is interesting. First of all, it's changing all the time. And then you have failures happening all the time. So you take a service like VSTS, we got so many dependencies. We have SQL Azure, and we have DNS, we have AD, and we have storage. There are so many dependencies. Each of those dependencies give you three nines of availability. So if your system was designed such that if SQL Azure failed, you fail, well, you're never going to get to three nines because you know when you combine the availability of all the other dependent system, you simply cannot achieve that. So, so that's why you build all these resiliency mechanisms in the product that Buck talked about. But how do you know what those mechanisms would actually work? So you have to test the production environment. Uh, you, you need to see that the fallback mechanism you've designed actually works. You need to see that a failure that starts in one subsystem doesn't cascade and become a major catastrophe for the entire product. So these type of things that we, we do in, uh, in production with what we call fault injection testing or uh, you know, sort of uh, chaos monkey testing, I'll talk about that in a second. And yeah, like I said, yes, we do run tests in production. These are L3 tests. And we run that to kind of help us with the service compared testing. Yeah. So what data do you use for L3? Is it like the engineering data or like fake data in production? We, we use some, uh, I'll show you in a, when I talk to the L3 that we use the test account to, 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 to do that. So uh, I'll show you in a second. Um, so let's walk through an example of uh, um, this fault injection testing that I talked about. Buck talked about circuit breakers. Uh, they were big roles to play in, in production. They're very important. But how do we know whether the circuit breakers they're put in place they actually work, and, this, and there are two really questions uh, we are going after. One is that does the fallback behavior works? So when the circuit breaker opens, you're supposed to go back to your fallback. Does it actually work? Does it fall back, and does the fallback work? That's number one question. The second question is, does the circuit breaker open? You know, does it uh, have the right sensitivity to open when it needs to open? So these are the two things we try to we try to test. So I, I'm going to show you. 
You ask about a test in uh, a, a demo. This is a PowerPoint demo, but I guess it gets a little bit close to what you are asking, but not for the L0 test, but something else. So let's do a case study of uh, testing a Redis circuit breaker. Now, Redis is a, is a non-critical dependency in the product. It's a distributed cache, which means if it's down, the system should continue to just work. Um, it should just go back to the source. Um, and we have a circuit breaker that's wrapping the Redis call, and so we want to make sure that the circuit breaker works. So the hypothesis is that if the Redis goes down, the circuit breaker should just kick in and uh, you know, switch to the fallback, and the fallback should take over. So that's the, the thing that we are trying to test. So here, here, is, here is how it would work. So you have the 380s, you have a Redis breaker wrapped, wrapping the calls to Redis, and the SQL is the fallback. So through, we'll, we'll do a config change and open the circuit breaker. Buck talked about how we use a config change to open or close circuit breaker, so that's what we would do. Through a config change, force the circuit breaker to open, see that the call goes to SQL, the, the fallback, and once the, we threw another uh, config change, reset the circuit breaker, and the call returns back to Redis. Okay, so that test that the fallback worked, uh, but doesn't answer the other question, which is, did the circuit breaker open? Uh, because remember, we forced the change. We forced it to open. You actually want it to open in, with a real failure. So this is where the fault injection uh, um, comes into play, where through a fault agent, we can introduce a fault um, for that call going to Redis. So fault injector, Redis requests are blocked at this point and then see that the fallback works. The circuit breaker opens, the fallback works, and then uh, you take, remove the fault. Now the circuit breaker would send a test request to Redis, and if the test request passes, it, uh, the, the call reverts back to, uh, to Redis. So this is an example of the type of testing that we can only do with fault injection because we can simulate the failures that would happen in real life uh, and, and be prepared for it when it actually happens. Um, so, you know, through this, we've, we've kind of found all kinds of problems. I, I actually think we, we can do a lot more in this realm. We are, we are sort of scratching the surface, but uh, to the extent that we've done this, we've found all kinds of interesting uh, issues with this. So, you know, things like the fallback doesn't work. You know, you, you, uh, you introduce a fault and see that the, the, the service doesn't fall back to the uh, its fallback mechanism, or the circuit breaker doesn't open. It's not sensitive enough, meaning you thought that in real world failure scenario, circuit breaker would open, but it's not sensitive. Maybe the threshold is too high, so it waits for the failure much longer than what you anticipated. Uh, that's the kind of things you'll find. Or uh, there'll be some other system timeouts that would interfere with the circuit breaker behavior. You know, we, we found those kind of issues too. The, the point is that, and these are all real issues that we have found, the examples that I'm giving here, here uh, that, that would otherwise uh, have run in, become a real uh, life side issue. It could have become a self one issue or self zero issue in, in some cases uh, that we were able to prevent by, by doing this type of testing in production. Again, you, it's very hard to do this, this type of testing in, in the lab, so kind of going back to what is the role of some of this integration end-to-end -end test in the lab, this is where it kind of has a diminished role uh, um, in, in, in sort of, uh, and, and this kind of testing in production is more favored. Um, yeah, I mean, just some lessons here. Yes, do chaos engineering, but do it in your ring zero. Um, I think ring zero concept was introduced. This is the ring that we run our own service, uh, our own team, uh, team's engineering system on. So if something fails and it goes haywire, then we are only hurting ourselves. We're not hurting uh, customers to your uh, you know, kind of questions like, are, uh, are you nuts you're doing this in production? Well, we do it, but we do it carefully. Um, you you want to automate these experiments. These are these are exp expensive tests. Like doing this kind of testing that I just talked about, where you, in, you inject a fault and you see the failure takes place. And I mean these things are not easy to do the first time you do it. But I think you can over time by building the right tooling, the right automation, you can institutionalize these this kind of uh, uh, testing throughout your organization. Uh, by the way, this is a whole. Uh, what should I say, um, 
practices around, around this, you can find more information uh, at that link. All right, the other type of uh, you know, failover testing or, or, or failure testing we do in production is this thing called BCDR. I'm sure you all are familiar with, this is a business continuity and disaster recovery program that most companies have and we have one too. It's very formal uh, where we track you know, sort of for each service what, are, uh, what is the uh, importance of the business if it's that service goes down, sort of we you know, rank our services. We have formal disaster recovery plans. But one of the things that I've learned uh, over the years is that just documenting a disaster recovery plan is never good enough. You know, I give you a little bit of story. Um, I was in my, you know, in my previous team where we had a major outage going on, and this is advertising system for Bing. So you, you, you know, you're thinking millions of dollars flowing through that, and we were two hours into the outage, and uh, I, we, we have no solution in sight. So I looked to my ops team and I, I asked them, "Hey, let's just do the failover." And he looks back in my eyes and goes. No, I don't want to do the failover. I'm like, what do you mean you don't want to do the failover? We have the whole failover procedure. We've kind of built it. And he just didn't want to do it. And it happened again. In the second uh, outage happened, and I would say, let's do the failover. And he wouldn't do, the, do it again. Uh, after that, I learned that the reason he didn't want to do it is because it, the, uh, it was just formally documented. It was not exercised you know, in recent times. So he just lacked the confidence to go do it. So he said, no, it's better to fix the problem. Let's not do a failover. The key point here is that you, you want to test your failover procedures in real world. And you want to, it's not just a documented plan, but you want to do this in a regular drills. 